Hi, thanks for tuning in today. Today, I just wanted to share a few thoughts with you about the Textus Receptus and translations that are based on the Textus Receptus. I did a poll to see what people wanted to see from my channel, and this was one of the uh, things that came up. There's a good uh, comment that was left that some, somebody wanted to see a video like this, so I want to oblige and make a video about the different translations that are based on the Textus Receptus. Now, you don't have to necessarily regard the Texas Receptus as absolutely perfect to have a love and admiration for the Texas Receptus. It is a uh, edition of the Greek New Testament that became the Protestant Greek New Testament. It was the Greek New Testament of Luther and Calvin and the magisterial reformers and um, those even in the radical uh, Reformation. We're reading translations based on the Textus Receptus. It's a Greek text that stands behind some of our great uh, historic translations like the Geneva Bible, the King James Version Bible, the Tyndale. So there are a lot of reasons to admire the Textus Receptus and to be interested in it. There are people who um, would be interested in the Textus Receptus mainly with their, because of their concern with the King James Version Bible. Uh, but that's not the case with everyone. There are some people who don't necessarily ha have the same esteem for the King James Version, but have a very strong um, draw towards the Texas Receptus. So we can't uh, paint with too broad of a stroke. But I think no matter where you stand on these textual issues, whether you're a critical text advocate or you're a Byzantine uh, majority text person or confessional text person, I think everyone should have an interest in the Texas Receptus. Someone recently commented on one of my videos uh, that serious scholars aren't interested in the Texas Receptus anymore. Well, I think that depends on how you define serious and um, how you, uh, how much you're interested in interacting with everyday people. Um, many, many people in the pews are reading translations which are based on the Texas Receptus. So if you're interested in the man in the pew, pew and not just academia, then you should have, in my judgment, an interest in the Texas Receptus. Okay, the first one I would just mention, um, I've done a couple uh, videos, two or three videos on this, is the King James Version Bible. I love the King James Version Bible. I am not a King James Version onlyist. Uh, so if you came to this channel looking for a King James Version onlyist, I'm unfortunately not your guy. But um, I do love the King James Version. Hold it in high esteem. It's my favorite English translation. I think it's uh, extraordinarily beautiful and wonderful. I read from it. I teach my children the language of the King James Version Bible. And I and have this great esteem for it. And of all the translations I'm going to talk about today, again, by far, it's my favorite. And it has such a, a great and uh, magisterial history and influence on the English language that I think everyone owes it to themselves. Even, again, if you're not a TR advocate or even that interested in the Byzantine tradition, I think everyone owes it to themselves to read deeply um, and often from the King James Version Bible because it's had such an impact on our culture and history that I think everyone owes it to themselves. So there's lots of videos out there about the King James Version. I won't spend a whole lot of time on that. Um, I'll leave maybe something up there that you can click on that uh, will give you some more information on my views on the King James Version Bible. Okay, so the next one I would talk about is the modernized Geneva Bible. Everybody's heard about the Geneva Bible. Now, if you're trying to read through a original edition of the Geneva Bible, you might find the language of it quite difficult. Canon Press has done an update on the uh, Geneva Bible, and um, I've done a review of this. And uh, they have these booklets. They've broken up the New Testament into these um, nice booklets, and uh, it's very readable. And it is one option. This is called a reader's edition. This is one option for a lover of the Texas Receptus tradition, is the modernized Geneva Bible. I've done a full review of this. Now, the, one of the drawbacks will be 
because if you're reading from the modernized Geneva Bible, this is not the kind of set that you can take to church. Not a real handy, I mean, I guess you could take this to church, but you probably get some pretty odd stares if you're, you know, pulling volume after volume out to try to keep up with um, the sermon. And it's not really been made into a format that is very portable. As far as I'm aware, I think they've only done the New Testament so far. They, maybe they've done the uh, Hebrew Old Testament. Um, well, I shouldn't say Hebrew Old Testament. They, they may, maybe they've done the update on the Old Testament. I'm not aware if they have yet or not. The other drawback to this um, translation is going to be that not a lot of other people are going to be using it. Um, so some things to consider, but if you're wanting to read from the Textus of Receptus and you're wanting an alternative to the King James Version Bible and you're just setting it down in your armchair and, and want to read from the Scriptures, that would be a good option for you. So the next one that I will talk about is the New King James Version. So the New King James Version, you probably have had a chance to look at it. I'll just give you a few thoughts on it. It is an update on the King James Version, and in my opinion, I don't think it retains all of the beauty of the original King James Version Bible, but overall I've been pretty impressed with it when I've compared uh, different translations and uh, the Greek text. I've been favorably impressed with the New King James Version. What I do like about it is um, it will list differences between itself, um, its base text, against the critical text, and also the majority text. Um, so that's something to consider. Now I will mention there's been some videos that have been put out about this. If you're looking for a strict rendering of the same Greek text that the King James Version used, there are some places, so that's typically uh, referred to as the Scrivener text, the Scrivener TR. There are various editions of the Textus Receptus. Some of these editions have differences among themselves. If you're looking for a strict rendering of the Scrivener edition of the TR, there are some instances where the New King James Version will depart from the Scrivener edition of the TR. I don't know why, but there are a few instances like that. Um, okay, so moving on. Another translation that I would like to mention in this vein is one that I like quite a bit, and that is Young's Literal Translation. And I have a copy. Hard, uh, you can get this online. Um, Logos has it too. Various um, Bible software programs will have this, but it's Young's Literal Translation. I've used this translation quite a bit, and it is very good. I really like it. Um, its renderings of the Greek tend to be very accurate. And what a lot of people don't know about Young's Literal Translation, this is not a very attractive cover at all, but um, Young's actually made a companion volume for this. So, my chair is kind of noisy, but this is Young's Concise Critical uh, Bible Commentary. And it is a very good reference tool and companion to his translation that goes into some more details about some of the words that are used. But I've found Young's Literal Translation to be very good. What would be some of the drawbacks to Young's Literal, literal Translation? Well, if you're looking for a nice leather-bound edition of Young's Literal Translation, you're going to be pretty much out of luck. Um, as far as printed editions, you're going to end up with probably something like this. The other drawback is if you're using it in a church setting, hardly anybody else is going to use Young's Literal Translation. However, that all being said, I think it's a very handy reference tool. Uh, a lot of the Bible software programs will not contain his original preface, which I think is kind of a drawback. It's interesting to see why he's chosen to use the received text, the Texas Receptus. In his judgment, Rendering the Hebrew and Greek text accurately and literally was more important than trying to choose between different manuscript readings. And so it's interesting, many good things in his preface, but you won't find that in the uh, uh, Logos edition at least. So moving on, another popular one that's out there is the modern English version, the, the MIV 
and um, this is one that I've probably used uh, the least. I've I've hardly used it at all. What I've seen of it and some of the comparisons that I've done, my impression of it hasn't been all that great so far. Sometimes I think it's it's it tries to be very just like its name modern and some of its renderings to me lack some of that beauty and and rhythm that's uh, in the King James version. The advantage is that they do have several um um leather bound options or at least a uh, pseudo leather or something like that that's available. I mean it actually looks like a bible. You can buy it like that. There, okay, so I found their frequently asked questions on the modern English version webpage to be enlightening. So they give an example of Matthew 11.4. And translations will sort of wrestle with this a little bit because the uh, synoptic gospels sometimes carry over uh, influences from their, you know, he- Hebraic background. And so sometimes you'll you'll come into phrases where it will say something like, and Jesus answered and said, or Jesus answering and said. And there's a little bit of question how you're going to render that participle. And so instead of translating every single word, uh, they say, in such instances it's important to realize certain words may go untranslated. Now, I'm uh, completely familiar with the fact that when you're rendering from one language to another, it's almost impossible to get a one-to-one correspondence. But the way that they've um, handled this, the way that they've translated this, it would not be my preferred way to do it. I'm, I'm not saying that it's wrong, but I like to see some of the Hebraic uh, background, even if it makes a little bit of awkward English. I would rather see some of that um, Hebraic redundancy expressed in my English translation because it makes me question it a little bit more. Why did they do this? Well, if there's a if they're being influenced from their Hebraic background, that's something that I want to be aware of. I don't just want to smooth it out uh, like the modern English version has. It's a very small thing. I'm not saying what they've done is mistranslated. That's not what I'm saying at all. Translating from one language to another is tricky, and I think there's sometimes more than one accurate way to translate something. So I'm not faulting them as much as I'm saying that's not necessarily that's not necessarily what I would want from my uh, translation. Now you might like a translation that smooths some of those things over, uh, and that's going to come down to a personal uh, decision. Uh, but some of these participles are difficult to translate, and I totally understand why they might do that. But I would prefer to retain um, Jesus answering and said, or Jesus answered and said, like the King James version does. Um, some people would argue there in Matthew eleven four whether that participle is a participle of attendant circumstance or, or whatever. But the modern English version uses that as an example to show how they've sort of smoothed out uh, their translation to make smooth English. So you sort of have to make a choice: Are you going to have your English translation make good sense, good vernac- and be in good English vernacular, or are you going to try to make your translation as thin a veil as possible. So just some issues to consider with the modern English version. Again, the other drawback is going to be very few people are using the modern English version, and so if you're using it at church, you're going to be, find out that uh, very few people are, are going to be reading from that translation. Okay, Okay. so I'm going to make two more honorable mentions. Now these two translations I'm going to miss, uh, mention here are not strictly from the Texas Receptus. Um, They are based more on the majority text. So there is a slight difference between the majority text and the Texas Receptus. Uh, Generally speaking, the majority text or Byzantine text agree, and we're talking about 98% of the time they agree. There are some instances where your majority text and your Texas receptives are going to disagree. There's probably about 1,800 uh, mostly very minor differences between those two. Um, and and some people are going to prefer the TR over the majority text, and some people are going to prefer the majority text over the TR. I think it's, again, a relatively minor 
uh, disagreement among brethren, except in maybe a few uh, key passages, 1 John 5, 7, and uh, one out of Acts 8, uh, and maybe a couple others. But for the most part, when you're talking about like the woman caught in the act of adultery, uh, the uh, so-called longer ending of Mark, you're going to find that your majority text and your Texas Receptus are going to agree in the vast majority of cases where there are serious questions between the critical text and the Texas Receptus. But a couple that are more based on the broader Byzantine tradition would be the world, one, one would be the World English Bible. This is a, a neat project that was done online. It is in the public domain. It was based on the um, American Standard Version of, I think, 1901, and they updated it to reflect the readings of uh, the Byzantine text and the the majority text. So that's an interesting project. They put it into the, I think I, I mentioned this, they put it into the public domain, so that's that's really interesting. I think it's still sort of a work in progress. I don't think you can buy any kind of leather-bound edition of it, but it is a nice tool to compare. Similar, uh, in a similar fashion, um, Wilbur Pickering has his own edition of, the, of his Family 35, which is basically a very close to majority text. Um, and then also there is an English majority text uh, version, which I've done a review on as well. It's out there. And the final one that I will mention is the Eastern Orthodox Bible. And in the New Testament, I don't have the Old Testament edition of it. This um, I've done, again, a review of this, but um, it's a very neat uh, portable edition. Uh, not too long ago, James Snap Jr. did a good uh, blog post on uh, the utility of this volume. And it is based on the patriarchal text, which is, again, very much in line with this Byzantine majority text. It's not exactly a, a TR edition, but I think in, in some ways it's closer to the TR tradition than it is to the uh, strictly Byzantine text form, something like you'd find in Robinson Pierpont. Uh, it retains 1 John 5, 7, but it marks it off as a, a questionable uh, text. But the value and utility of this volume is how many textual notes that it gives you where there are variants between itself, the Textus Receptus, the majority text, and even when it has quotations from the um, Old Testament, it's identifying whether this is coming from like the LXX or whether it's coming uh, more directly translated from the uh, Masoretic text. So I find this volume very helpful. So hope you find this video kind of helpful, a, a little bit of a guide to different options. I'm sure this does not exhaust the list of, of uh, translations that are available now, readily available. There's many older tr translations that are also available. But if you've got some that you'd like to add to the list, make sure you drop it down into the comment section, and we'll use that comment section as a little bit of an archive. We'll share with one another and learn from one another. So again, hope this video has been useful to you, and I'll look forward to seeing you on the next one.